Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Edie Myers Power. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the program manager at NAMI Eastside. Um, you're joining us tonight for our monthly educational forum. So thank you so much for taking some time out of your evening. This program is sponsored by Evergreen Health, and we're super grateful to them for um, providing this space monthly for us. Um, Tonight, I am so excited to have um, some folks, uh, some of our partners from Disability Empowerment Center, as well as someone who's participated in programs both at DEC and over here at NAMI Eastside, joining us tonight um, to talk about um, disability and mental health, how they overlap, how they interact with each other, how they affect each other, and, and their own lived experience uh, in uh, experiencing disability and mental health. So um, it is Disability Pride Month this month. So uh, in celebration of that, I'm so, so excited to uh, welcome our friends from DEC. So thank you so much for being here, Mandy and Doris. Um, would you go ahead and uh, please introduce yourself? Um, tell us about your lived experience with disability and um, how does that add to this conversation? Um, hi, so I'm Mandy. I go by she, her pronouns. I'm from Disability Empowerment Center. Um, I'm a peer um, with anxiety disorder. I also have a physical disability and some other kinds of chronic conditions. So it's my lived experience. It helps me in my job because all, all everything that we do is based on our lived experience and meeting people where they are. So I'll just quickly put that together and come back later. <laughs> Hi, I'm Doris, and I'm a former participant of the Disability Empowerment Center, and I also um, go to NAMI Eastside groups, and um, I have uh, bipolar disorder, and then I also deal with a mild cognitive impairment, and um, for many years, it was just the bipolar disorder, and then with having a second thing come on, it affected me heavily. It affected my mental health heavily to try and deal with a second disability. Um, and so I'm happy to be here and talk about that experience and answer any questions possibly later about uh, my experience with disability empowerment. Very cool. Thank you so much to both of you. I saw Mandy um, you mentioned Cynthia is also from Disability and Empowerment Center. Cynthia, would you like to introduce yourself for us? Yeah, my name is Cynthia Coffin. I'm new, I'm new hire at Disability Empowerment Center. And I also um, am familiar with NAMI through Colorado. I had a friend of mine that used to be on the board. She used to work for NAMI. But I also have mental health issues of dealt with uh, borderline personality disorder and PTSD. And um, that's and I'm also a recent graduate master's of social work from Metropolitan State University of Denver. And yeah, I'm just wanted to introduce myself. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much and congratulations on your MSW. I got mine last year too. So um, oh, yeah. wow. Very cool. I have a fellow MSW in the room. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Very what cool. What did you I did mine at uh, U University of Washington in Seattle. Yeah, oh, right cool. nearby. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for being here. I'm super excited to get this conversation started. So, um, Mandy, I'll start with you. Um, who is Disability Empowerment Center and uh, what services do y'all provide to people with disabilities? All righty. Uh, so we are a free nonprofit agency in King County. So we um, mainly serve people in, we do serve people in Cal County. Um, and we are peer led, meaning that we are people with disabilities ourselves or, you know, people with lived experience offering assistance to others who also identify with a disability. Sometimes it could be a self-identification. Other times it's a diagnosis. It doesn't really matter. As long as you're between the ages of 14 to an older adult and you would like services and you want to establish uh, a goal of some kind, um, that's really all that matters. So yes, yeah, so we do offer information and referrals. So someone might say, I, I really want to find out more about NAMI or I don't know where mental health 
peer groups are. And then I would, we would say, well, check out NAMI. This is where you go. These are the different locations. But other times people want more, um, we call them an independent living plan, which is essentially an action plan. Person comes in, wants a goal. We, we talk about, okay, how do you want to word it? And we use, for those of you, I don't know, you guys know some goals. When you, um, we try to make it specific and measurable and time bound so that we can say that within like three months, this person will have X, Y, and Z done. And um, he, she, they will be able, will do this, this, and this. And me, Mandy, the independent living specialist will do this, this, and this. And that might mean also including follow-up appointments, checking in once in a while over the phone, um, having someone in the room. Uh, well, like if some, some people like when they're trying to talk to other agencies and such and they get nervous, it's nice having a peer in the room to be like, you got this. So uh, that's, I'm trying to think if I have missed anything, I was going to open something up and I got all confused. Um, yeah, so essentially, I mean, I'll, um, uh, we're all about empowering people to live um, with autonomy and choice. And that comes from our mission. And so equity, choice, autonomy, a sense of empowerment, all those things are like our major values. Um, I mentioned some of the, you know, the peer type stuff that we do. We also have peer groups. Um, one is more of a social type of gathering where we have different topics. Uh, last time, uh, this this month we did crafts, which was like people would come in with their either crocheting needles or we did friendship bracelets. Next month, we're going to be talking more about self-advocacy and what that means to people and how we can build that skill so that we, you know, especially if we come up against barriers in the community, um, we all talk about just developing skills to live as independently as we choose, transitioning from one life thing to another, where it could be school to work, it could be institutionalization to community-based living. Um, and then we would just kind of like to model what it's like to be independent and to advocate and mentor you know, in our own lives. So um, uh, the one thing I often talk about is how we uh, we do with, not for. So that's also part of empowerment. It's like, um, I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to follow you. You lead and I'll, you know, I'll be your passenger and we'll work together. And if something kind of goes awry, we can problem solve it and kind of figure out some solutions and see what, what comes out from that. So I I can share my, I can share our uh, website and also our social media. I'll just share my screen if you like. Do you have any questions in the meantime? That's it now, okay. So. Yeah, if you wanna put the, um any social media or any website links that you want to put in the chat as well, that would be super great. Sorry, I'm trying to log into something, <laughs> making noise. Um, oh, and then it's like that too, verification thing. Um, okay, I'm just going to go here. So we do have a Facebook group and we also have, we're also on Instagram. And people can find out about our different peer programs and and upcoming events and things. Um, a lot of what we, yeah, on on the on both social media platforms, and we also do a lot of promotion. So we'll go to like vendor fairs and talk about our agency and see if people are interested through Alkin County if you know to work with us or to work in tandem with us and another agency. So it's not exclusive as well. That's important to note. Um, yeah. Oh, and we always want to we always want to make sure that people understand we're not case managers or therapists. Um, even if we are, like, do you have a master's in social work or something? We're not coming to you as a social worker. We're coming to you as a person with lived experience, and so it's really important for our participants to know that right off the bat. Um, give me one second. I wasn't seeing. 
Do, 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 share screen, just be if there's any sound. So this is our website and it's just, um, yeah, this, we believe everyone deserves to be treated with equity to be included and have choice. Um, and these are the different ways that the different types of target populations and how we network and work with businesses specifically around accessibility issues and how to better um, be inclusive. Um, so you can always, this is just our front page. I'm trying to find, um, yeah, so essentially you can go to disabilityempowerment.org and navigate through all of this. Um, and I don't have my login for Instagram or Facebook, but can I put that in the chat for people to check us out? Because there you'll find flyers and you'll find updated information and announcements about Disability Awareness Month and what's going on and all that jazz. Yeah, absolutely. If you want to just put the um, username of the Instagram page or whatever, any other social media, so that would be that would be super great. Um, you did get a couple um, questions in the chat, Mandy. In okay, your, I'm just, yeah. I'm just trying to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> like, okay. Oh, there you go. No All right. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yes, I see. So from Pan and Annette. Okay. So the only thing that, for so it, um, Pam's asking about eligibility for services. The only thing that really is, well, there's a couple. Be, be between the ages of 14 years and old, I, and older, excuse me. Um, and to also be living in King County. So um, those are the main things. As long as you self-identify with a disability, we take your word for it. There's no need for a doctor's note or any written paperwork or any of that stuff. So we, yeah, so you just walk through our door, doors um, and say, uh, you know, I have a disability, I would really like services. We free so people don't have to worry about that part of it. I hope that makes sense. Um, oh, yes. Uh, and that's asking about intake process. So you can email, we have our, our main email address is, and I can also add this in the notes too, but it's info at disabilityempowerment.org. And when we get that, um, one of us will call. So we have a, we still kind of have a small staff but they're like Cynthia, for instance, works in our Seattle office. We have a Redmond office at the Together Center. We also have an Auburn office. Um, and so when you when you go when you go to info at disability, when, well, when you email us at info at disability empowerment, we all get it, and then it's kind of routed to whoever could will become the independent living specialist. And then, um, and so in my case, if so and so says I would like an intake. I would just schedule it on my calendar at the time that works for both of, the, of us. They would, we could do a virtual appointment over Zoom or in person. Um, and then we have a quick enrollment form that just says like, what are your basic demographics? Do you want a plan right now? Or are you kind of just wanting a resource? Um, or is it something like you want to be a participant, but um, don't, you don't want to do an active plan at this moment. So it just kind of gives kind of the parameters of where the person is and um, and they can decide how often they want to meet, um, how long they want a goal to last, you know, what, what they feel they can do, what they feel they cannot do and how they have like assistance. And you live in Snohomish, you can, oh, no, unfortunately not. We have another, we, um, and by the way, Cynthia, if you want to pipe in, I offer that because <laughs> I mean, yeah, but only if you want to, you don't have to feel like you put on the spot. I'm just. Okay. Yeah. Um, Thanks. Right. So it's, oh, so we have a, what is a, a, I guess you could call it a sister agency called Center for Independence. And so if you're in Snohomish County, you can email them and they have their own intake process. It's they pretty much have all the same services we do. Uh, the overarching name for our type of agency is Center 
for independent living, or SIL for short. And so there's several independent, uh, there's several SILs around the area and throughout the United States. Um, did I answer everyone's questions? How can we speak to a peer support person? Uh, May, can you tell me more about that question? What that means to you? Is she here? I'm sure. I think what I, I'll go ahead and drop your website um, into yeah. the chat again. And then I did, I did go ahead and put your info at disabilityempowerment.org email in the chat as well. Um, so, but I'll put a link to, um, I think, uh, Beatrice, I think you joined us maybe a little a little late and so you missed when um, oh. Mandy was going over our services earlier but here is the link to their website where um, you can find everything that Mandy went over earlier. Um, I do have some more some more questions to ask our folks that joined us today so I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep going and we can circle back with more audience questions at the end. Um, yeah. But thanks everyone for all your all your engagement, and your participation. I'm super excited about this. Um, so I will put this question back to to y'all. Um, what are some of the barriers that folks with disabilities face when seeking mental health care? Can I speak on that? Um, I think for me, mine, some of the barriers would be being afraid of how therapists view people with disabilities and coming open to your therapist about having a disability. That That's a huge barrier. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I know. Um... I think that's a barrier for a lot of folks who, who you know, with a, a ton of different identities is all, you know, bias judgment, right? Um, uh, Doris, I wonder if you wouldn't mind speaking on um, any barriers that you face when you're seeking mental health care for yourself. I would say sometimes um, there are misunderstandings about um, what I might be dealing with. And so I don't feel that um, sometimes doctors who will refer to mental health specialists or other types of specialists understand um, exactly what's going on. Um, and uh, that, that feeling of maybe not being believed or um, it, it, it's heavy and it makes it hard to advocate for oneself for certain services. Um, and I think also stigma, just starting out on the mental health side. Um, sometimes people uh, look at you differently and the message is received differently than what's intended. Um, so I found that to be a, a huge barrier for me. Um, and then other things that uh, sometimes take place can just be financial and how to access funds for transportation to get somewhere or to pay a copay, or the lack of services available. So maybe you have to travel really far to get to someone. Um, and uh, just having to go through multiple people and interviews and um, to try, first of all, get an appointment, number one, and then secondly, to you know actually find a good fit. So those things, I think when you don't have a disability are hard, but then if you do, it just becomes that much harder. Um. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much for, for sharing. I love everyone chiming in in the chat as well. Le definitely a lot of um, comments on insurance, financial, transportation, lack of providers. Um, also being misdiagnosed and having uh, access in a timely manner to speak with a doctor. Absolutely. These are all really big, really big barriers. So 
my next question that I want to ask um, is if you, um, and, and of course people, anyone can chime in on this. If you're having, if you have a non-mental health disability, how has it impacted your mental health or vice versa? Um, and how, if you have an invisible disability, how has that impacted um, mental health or vice versa? Well, I was going to say for me, it's been more of a, I had a brain injury and I had a TBI and I feel like it's always being put off as my mental health. And it's like, I can never get a straight answer one way or the other, or a straight diagnosis one way or the other. It's always, I feel like, um, I feel like I'm being put off with doctors around my TBI because I was misdiagnosed with it and now it's just my mental health and it's like well I actually had a brain injury I should be seeing a <laughs> different doctor it's just I feel like I'm going in this vicious circle and it's non-forgiving and it's never ending and I, I am so very um, confused by it and I I just don't know where to go for support. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like just DEC might be a really great resource for you, honestly. Amanda, you unmuted. Um, gosh, um, uh, for... oh, it looks like you muted again, Mandy. Sorry. Oh, um, Edie, I just put, I just put the Facebook and Instagram. Oops. Oh, your mute is on again, Mandy. I don't, I don't know what it keeps Sorry. wanting to turn back um, on. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, so in terms of uh, like one of the things that we teach is how to advocate for yourself. And I'm not going to say it's easy because I work there and I am still learning how to advocate for myself. And it is, it's, um, it can be very difficult. I think some of it's internal oppression, internalized oppression. And some of it's just that people are ignorant and they don't understand. Um, so we will be doing like a peer support group on the third Thursday in August about how to advocate for yourself and meet and you'll be meeting other people with lived experience um, that will, will be, we we'll usually get like, I don't know, it's, it's a very small group. It's like between three and maybe five people a, a month. So, um, and that's at our Seattle office, which I can also put in the chat. Um, but as what I'm noticing is for myself, what I'm noticing um, is that when people, people will notice my physical disability, I have, I have several palsies and then it affects my left side. So they see my hand like, well, here it is here like that. <laughs> um, but they, they don't necessarily know about my mental health um, disability unless I have some, a panic attack or I start getting really overwhelmed. Um, and, and oftentimes I don't even sense it. So like I will sound overwhelmed and Doris, if I may, you'll be like, Amanda, you sound really overwhelmed, right? I'm like I do. Um, and I've heard that from a couple of my coworkers. <laughs> like, I, I don't think so, but but because I've also in my head, I I know what it's like to be on the, you know, to go to the bottom of the pit. So when I think overwhelmed, I think, oh, I'm not at the bottom of the pit yet. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is answering your question <laughs> or um no it's it is it is oh, yeah okay. it, and it's great to hear it's great to hear all your different your different experiences and perspectives so yeah. yes please yeah I wish we had a newsletter uh, well actually hold on a second we do have a newsletter it's just not your in the mail snail mail name I'm actually a little you can hear it right now I'm like tumbling over my words tumbling stumbling thank you um so if you go to our website at the very bottom of that website, 
is it will say sign up for e-newsletter. Um, and then you'll get emails, email updates and such. Um, well, I am, did that answer your question? So someone asked that. Oh yeah, I was gonna send the, the link for that. But yes, I can see that just at the very bottom of the homepage, you scroll all the way down and there's sign up for email updates. So oh. I'll, I'll send that link in the chat again. Great. Um, yeah, anyone else wanna chime in on just um, like how has your, how has your, if you have a non-mental health disability, how has that affected your mental health and vice versa? Anybody else want to chime in on that one? For me, I um, deal with a cognitive issue and I deal with a mental health issue. And for mental health, in trying to maintain a balance for bipolar disorder, I, I can't work too much and I can't work too little. I have to find that right place. Well, then I began having cognitive issues. And so that created a whole nother layer. Um, for me, it, it has to do with slow processing and um, attention. And so that I keeping up with work is a huge thing. And so I've, I've had to really, instead of just watching one balancing <laughs> act, it's two. It's how do I not overwhelm myself? That's a, the, you know, the constant for me. And, um, you know, the cognitive disability forces me to slow down. And with, as somebody with bipolar disorder who wants to just run ahead and get into everything, it, it almost helps me a little bit, but then of course it's also um, a huge challenge. Um, and, and then I would also say that people for my, um, my non-mental health disability generally don't understand it. And sometimes I feel like I don't. Um, or where to get help for it, uh, because it is an invisible disability. And I don't, I haven't found that exact right fit. And it was funny in going to Disability Empowerment Center, I was able to watch someone work and see that their brain sort of functioned like mine. And it made me feel so good <laughs> because I had felt so alone. And so I think Disability Empowerment Center gives so much and having a one-on-one -on -one coach that you can sit with who's gone through maybe not the exact same thing, but knows what it's like to struggle to be kind of on the outskirts of things. Um, it was huge for me because I came here from out of state and I had nobody and I'd have my little weekly appointment with my person at Disability Empowerment Center. And I was like, okay, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. I'm not alone. And um, it really got me through a hard time. And so I think, you know, anybody can use a friend and it's, it's you know, a professional friend, but it's somebody who's there and who gets, you know, that, that things are, are more difficult for us. So I really uh, appreciate it. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you had that such a positive experience and uh and I just I love I love what DEC does and I'm I'm loving it even more hearing hearing your personal experience about it so um I wonder Doris if you wouldn't mind if I if I stick with you for a little bit for this next question um I know you've attended NAMI groups as well um in addition to getting services from from DEC so I was wondering if um when you attended a NAMI group um, what things did you enjoy? What didn't go so well? And how do you think, um, how do you think that space could be better, um, made better for folks who have disabilities who are attending? I would say the main thing is, is just to come out of isolation, that there are other people who get it. And, you know, with invisible disabilities, it, you know, I still feel like I have to hide, um, that there's so much stigma. And to go to the group and everybody's in a different place, you know, um, in terms of our disabilities, in terms of our a level of ability to function in the current moment. And it's an opportunity to give others empathy and to receive it when you really need it. 
and to make friendships and, you know, just feel normal. <laughs> That's the big thing for me. And um, so I love going to my group and to go week after, week, you know, not week after, I go every two weeks. It's a uh, every two week group um, to go. And, you know, the same folks are there and you get to watch the changes in their lives and what's going on and be there for them if they're kind of struggling. And um, it's, and as far as making it better, um, I just want them more often, that's all. <laughs> so, <laughs> I didn't really give you a good answer for that one, but. <laughs> that's okay, that's okay, I'll take it, I'll take it. Frequency, consistency, yes, absolutely. Yeah, I um, I really want to, I know we, we've got a lot of different support groups and a lot of different programming that we do. And um, I'm always, as program manager, I'm always striving to make that, you know, a more, a, a, a safer space, a more accessible space, a more um, just overall, you know, something that can serve anybody and everybody. So um yeah, I uh Mandy or anyone else any any kind of thoughts that you guys have stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Um So I'm ha I my I my thoughts go faster in my head and so it's hard for me to process and articulate myself sometimes. Um So give me a second. Oh. I wanted to talk to some of the the stigma stuff that Doris was mentioning. Um, I, un unfortunately, I think as much as we've grown in the mental health field and in, you know, disability rights and, um, just disability stuff altogether, I think, I think there's a lot of internalized shame. And also there's a certain level of ignorance from the normal <laughs> people out there that, um, don't really either take it for granted or they, they don't know exactly how to respond to people when they when someone mentions it there uh some kind of disability or challenge and so you'll get oftentimes in in great in the greatest intentions people will just show you pity oh i'm so sorry that's one of my pit peeves um <laughs> big big time and i and i i'm always having to feel like having to explain i was born this way <laughs> i don't know anything different you know disability is not a bad word you know, having a mental health, you know, however you want to define mental health, mental health problem, mental health challenge, mental health disability is not a bad thing. It's just you're going through stuff and you need support. So um, I, th I think the way that it'd be really great to educate people on how to address, um, well, I think what I'm really kind of dancing around is this word ableism, which is all about how people assume that we're in an able-bodied world and that everyone lives that way and doesn't recognize some of the more insidious ways that it, you can a person with a disability can feel dismissed. And so language is a part of that. Um, whether you address a person directly or not is a part of that. You know, showing respect is a part of that. You may think you're respecting someone, but um, I had an experience yesterday. It really got to me and I had to call my friend like ASAP because I was just so overcome by it. I was at uh, Xfinity and um, I was trying to get a new phone and I was with my dad and my dad, you know, at, he had done research. He he wanted to talk to the person, the customer service person. And I gave him, I to be honest, to, to his credit, I did give him the, tor the torch to talk but at one point, the customer service person was talking only to him. And so here I was, you know, nodding my head and then like, well, she can do this and she can do that and she can do this and she can do that. And I was thinking, I'm right here. Can you look at me? Can you tell Can you talk to me in like first person? <laughs> you know, you're not just with my dad right here. And it was really, really. Um, well, the words coming to mind is stigmatizing and just brought up all that shame again, you know. Oh, I'm not good enough. Oh, I can't be in society. Oh, something's wrong with my brain. So. Yeah, that sounds like a really, really frustrating experience. And I know that's that's something that we're, you know, we're battling every day is <laughs> stigma. 
in in all sorts of ways. Um, I guess I like knowing that, you know, that's your personal experience and knowing that a lot of a lot of other people go through similar experiences. I will kind of I'll round us out with my last planned question, which was um, what what does advocating for people with disabilities mean to you and and why is it important that you're doing this work? Are you addressing me or others? You can certainly chime in first if you want to, Mandy. It's open to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, so right now, in fact, we have staff right now at DC, at Washington, D.C., educating uh, representatives about issues related to people with disabilities and, and how to pass legislature, legislation and things. It's really empowering to be able to have a voice and to be able to say, you know, we are a part of society and we are included. And um, these are the issues that are important to us. And it's kind of like that whole thing, uh, nothing without, nothing about us without us. So being able to be really included and have our, quite literally our voice, our choice, our input at the table is really powerful. So um, that's, and it excites me to think that that's, you know, part of the work that I'm doing. And, and instilling in people that come through my door, so. Hi, I just want to say I think it's very um, encouraging and courageous to speak up for people with, who have been marginalized, like people with mental health issues. And um, I'm American and I'm living in Canada right now. And unfortunately, I don't feel like we're even on the same, like on the same path, like the same level as the United States. I'm Cause I lived in Seattle for many, many years in town. And it's just, it takes a lot of courage. And I just want to say, keep, keep doing, keep on with it. So yeah, that's all. I think for me that with um, just overcoming disability and um, accepting my disability and helping others who've been through the same thing that I have, and that's the reason why I do the work every day. And it's one of the reasons why I applied for this mentally empowerment center because I really that's my main passion was to help others with people with disabilities uh, overcome challenges. Yeah, Cynthia, I I feel similarly about my work at NAMI East Side too, because that's um I I have a PTSD diagnosis and that's something I've struggled with and and that's a a hundred percent I'm passionate about helping people who've been through the same the same experience that I've been through. So I think that's that's really awesome and I'm glad to see you glad to see you joining the the DEC team. Thank you. Hope to keep working with you in the future. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Hopefully see you around. Maybe see you in the Together Center sometime. Um, would you like me to put some of the, the all three different addresses in the chat? Um, because we do have we do have three locations for people. Yeah. yeah, sure. What any information you want to um to drop in the chat is great. I know we've put the the email and the um the Facebook page and the Instagram page. Um, I, that, that's all the questions that I have. So I know people were, were really eager, eager to ask their questions at the beginning. So, um, if y'all are open to it, I will, I will open the floor back up for, for any other questions that the audience might have as well. Oh, 
No, I don't see where to raise my hand, Evie, on my computer. Under oh, that, that's that okay. okay. You can go ahead and go, Pam. Yeah, I just wanted <laughs> to ask again, I, and I asked it earlier, but, um, and I'm talking, I'm also involved with NAMI, um, but I am also involved in the Seattle OCD group. So, uh, and hoarding group. Um, and I'm just wondering, and I'm really excited about what you're doing. I'm so glad to hear about this. We had a, when uh, our group meets monthly and we in May, we did a thing on self-advocacy. So I'm really excited to hear about that group you're doing. Mm -hmm. I just wondering um, what, when you use the term disability, uh, does the DEC have a definition of disability that they use? Um. Well, so I'm trying to think officially as an agency, I don't think necessarily it's written down, but we pretty much as a general rules, think of anything as a disability. And I have this book called Demystifying, you can't see it. It's called Demystifying Disability by Emily, I'm going to write it down, by Emily Ladau, L-A-D-A-U. And um, I marked something here for that very reason. So when we're thinking about disabilities, we're thinking about a number of things. Uh, we have chronic illness, communication disorders, it could be developmental, delay, developmental delays, or it could be sensory things like hearing impaired, um, you know, vis visual impairment, any kind of sensory impairment, learning disability, physical disability. So it, you know, anything that's a neurological challenge. So we kind of just, we just, do it across the board. Um, one of the first things I told Edie is, you know, we talk about mental health and how can it intersect with disability. I said, well, mental health is considered a disability in our in our minds at our agency. So you don't have, you know, you could have anxiety, but you don't have to have any other disability and you could still see us. Yeah, thank you for that. Cause I'm, yeah. and I wanna introduce, I, I wanna send out a, you know, Thing to our group about it and yeah. I'm not sure that some people would identify even though they're living with a mental health uh -huh. disability but yet I think I think it can be um and so I want them to know about what you're doing there yeah. yes thank you um the one thing we we do want to make clear like during intake is that we aren't counselors so if you want a counselor that would be something to help you know give you a, a community resource to fight a counselor. Um, I remember that you were you were asking about barriers, Edie. And um, that's one of the things I've come across is that when people come and they like, I really need a therapist, like the Together Center has Sound Health as one of the therapy agencies, but they don't take Medicare. And so when someone says, well, I, I'm only on Medicare, you know, then it's like, okay, well, unless you have Medicaid and, or you have Medicaid and I don't know, Aetna or something like that. We can't see you and um that becomes a challenge so whether it's you know it could be transportation it could be insurance or lack thereof um being on you know some kind of disability without insurance <laughs> is a big one um and then again as as you know the whole stigmatization and not knowing how i i wish people would just ask you know how do you want me, you know, I see that I, how do you want me to address you? Like, is just to name it, just to name, yes, I have a disability. Yes, I have a mental health stuff, condition. And not make it a big deal. <laughs> That's kind of what I wish would happen. Um, and, you know, some people don't want to talk more about it, that, that, that's fine. Um, but everybody's unique, you know, some people own it and they're like, well, I'm fine to say I have cerebral palsy. I'm fine to say that I have depression. You know, other people like that's really too much information for me to divulge right now. And that's OK, too. And as you can tell, one of my things is I'm very long winded <laughs> and kind of tangential. Um, does that help, Pam? I'll mention something too. Mm -hmm. um, I once uh, came across this term called diagnostic overshadowing, which is what a lot of medical professionals do when they, if they're if they're 
if they're treating you with some kind of stigma um they use that word diagnostic overshadowing um mm. and also there was there was um there was a there was a nami magazine a number of years ago i think that they they might i don't know if they still produce it called the advocate what it was called mm. and um they they had an article about 10 or 15 years ago called the seven seven levels of stigma so they they really broke it down into into all different kinds of stigma not not just it's not just i mean stigma is a really big word mm. but they really did a good job of breaking it down into seven different kinds including like you know from professionals to, to patients and then institutions and all kinds of levels so that was it's a really good article if you can find it on if you do a search for it the seven what are you seven different kinds of seven, seven seven levels seven levels of stigma of okay. stigma that sounds really interesting yeah and and it kind of reminds me that's the the other barrier is putting you know making everything so medical medicalized for lack of a better word because you know you, you have to have a diagnosis you, in order to treat someone as a therapist you have to have a diagnosis so there's a label it would be, you know, so that becomes instead of seeing the whole person, you know, and the other thing, the 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 other intersections that the person may that may make up a person, they just putting you in this little box with a label. Well, we're coming to yeah. cool. Yeah, I think I might have found the article. That's just what I found when I googled, and um, I think. Uh, it has seven different kinds of stigma in this article. So it might be what you're talking about, David. But... I'm just going to copy paste it. Probably, probably is, yeah. There we go. Uh, is this something you can send out, like the, the recording or something or the chat? Yeah, outside? absolutely. So what, I, what I'll do after this, um, we I have one of my coworkers will upload the recording to YouTube and then everybody that's everybody that register for the the forum I will send out um just a follow up email with a recording I'll also send any any of the information we have in the chat here um like your uh, all of the contact information, any of the maybe like, you know, this is why a lot of times I type a lot of things into the chat, like the the name of the book that you were talking about earlier, Mandy, Demystifying Disability. I typed that in so that I can remember to include right. these yeah. little things for later. Um, so yeah, everyone will get a follow-up email with everything that I can possibly think to include from uh, from our conversation today. Um, so you can you can look forward to that in the next couple of days after today. That's awesome. Um, I think I saw uh, I went to the website uh, about housing. Is there help? What what is there about housing? You is know what. I shouldn't say anything. Okay, so we are not a housing provider. So when we talk about housing, what we're really talking about is how do we help people apply for housing, like low income housing or or um, temporary housing or whatever the need is. So, um, or help people navigate the system to know what the process is to, you know, and what they can expect or, because I mean, un unfortunately, like um, I, I know that King County Housing Authority is has a long waiting list, so they're not accepting more applications. And the same with Section 8. Um, I think Seattle Housing Authority is open, but also I think so there's so there's some stuff, it's just like um there's so many closed doors, pardon the pun, <laughs> um, to getting housing. And as you know, as I think you probably know, that's a housing. There's a lot of homeless people right now and many people they're just falling through the cracks so it's unfortunate to say the least uh beatrice i was just gonna speak um mm -hmm. to the housing crisis slightly uh, especially for um you know as folks with disabilities um mm -hmm. uh you are a lot of doors are closed there is a 
you know, huge need for affordable housing. Um, Seattle Housing Authority has the Section 8 waiting list open for anyone to apply. And what they are doing is anytime they receive vouchers, they will draw like the lottery from this waiting list. And what they are doing is they draw, you know, 20 people, they have 20 uh, vouchers. And out of those 20 people, they take, depending on where your income is and if you are homeless, they are the first people to be served. And say five of the people that they sign up on, you know, Section 8 are income over, you know, the 30% or poverty or their income's over. They actually um, put them back. And I could be wrong about that. Anyway, there's how they're trying to help with the housing crisis is service those that are on the Seattle Housing Authority wait list um, um, that are homeless at the time, um, you know, of the application um, and are uh, meeting a threshold, an income threshold, I think if it's below 30% or something. So anyway, um, but, but that waiting list is open and you can apply at any time for that. However, um, I have yet to hear of anybody receiving a voucher that way. Um, and I don't know when they actually get them. They don't really disclose, hey, we got vouchers now. We get vouchers now. So it's still kind of the same sit and wait feeling for the housing um, with Seattle Housing Authority. King County Housing Authority's uh, waiting list is open, um, but not oh, for Section 8. Oh, not okay. for Section 8. So um, you can apply for it's called an other types of affordable housing, which um, still have very, very long wait lists, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere from one year to, you know, nine years on some of them, but they have a slew of, of places and they will tell you on the website, you know, um, yeah, you know, this place has a waiting list. This waiting list, she is from, you know, one year to three years right now, or this waiting list is from this to that. They're very, good about that um but it's not section eight waiting list isn't open but king county um housing authority has um affordable housing um and or other types of affordable housing um options on there that you can't apply to um however, project based housing because i know it's project based housing well I've, it's yeah so yeah. it's basically there's so there's so many service, different types of mm -hmm. programs. There's project-based Section 8. There's um, uh, tax credit units. There's, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, there's just a slew of different um, programs. And basically what they are is there, a lot of them are like, um, uh, uh, what do they call it? Like the... Holly Park and High Point and areas like that are um, low income or affordable areas. Mm -hmm. um, they're like, um, oh, I'm not, I'm not explaining this correctly, but if you go on to the King County website and just look under other affordable housing, other options, you'll see. Um, and basically it is um, contingent to your income and so forth. Um, but a lot of these units that are, you know, um, based off of your income aren't not available. And that's usually the um, uh, project based Section 8. And that's that's just uh, most of those programs are severely high waiting lists. So you're absolutely right about that. But I, I mean, there's just so many names for the different programs. However, like I said, uh, for people with disabilities, what I would want to wanted to recommend, what I was getting to with this long, uh, this long uh, message I'm staying here um, is that uh, a lot of times at the hospital level, if you can, if you are working with a space or social worker in the hospital level, 
Um, and if you are homeless, uh, I recommend you um, to connecting with somebody at the hospital level with a social worker and or case manager through the hospital um, that you are at because they actually have access to more resources than some service providers. So um, anyway, that was just my recommendation. But. Well, thank you for that. I'm wondering how that would work because so the way our process is that someone hears about us and that does an intake and then unless they fill out a release information say, well, you know, I would like you to connect with such and such, you know, social worker at Evergreen. Then we we it, we're confidential, so we can't really talk on their behalf or visit them, or well, yeah, we wouldn't be able to connect or collaborate unless there is permission. So, right, and no, it's not like we do necessarily. Well, I mean, we'll meet people in the community, but more like in the sense of like, if you can get to our office we can meet at a Starbucks or a park or some other place that's close to your home. And we also don't, we also let people know that we are not out in their actual apartments. So any kind of communal area is fine, but their actual apartment is, is a no, no for us. So um, I'm just wondering how, you know, like if you were collaborating with me, how would we work on that so that I could get in touch with a social worker who could, you know, navigate the system around housing with that person. Right. So there's the trick, right? So, yeah. um, um, and like I said, um, I would, um, a lot of times um, it's usually through an emergency room visit or an emergency mm -hmm. visit. When you go in, you have to request this connection with this worker. Mm -hmm. This worker is only available through emergency avenues. But once you actually make that connection um, and you're and they don't just service you while you're in the emergency room, there's another part that people have. Um, it's kind of a, a false fact is that <laughs> they, yes, while you're in their care, they're to help you. But that's the point they, mm -hmm. that they even if they discharge you, you know, so to speak, that that you can still follow up with them. They're supposed to still be navigating for you to get you into a safe space, not back to the streets. And that's part of the um, Healthcare for the Homeless Network, um, HCHN and the CAG and all that is is doing um, this big thing around that. So how would we, how do we, you know, connect with these people and make sure that they're, you know, this is happening or they're connecting with those people. That's the hard part. That's, you know, making sure people know their rights. So adv advocating for themselves and saying, hey, I need to see somebody. I'm homeless. I can't go back to the streets. Mm -hmm. And making sure that caseworker um, says, hey, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm going to help you. And this is, you know, who you can contact. I, I'm not sure how somebody who is an advocate or somebody who's helping a person in that situation would do it, but outside of a release of information, that's probably what you would, same avenue you'd have to go down and help, you know, to help somebody yeah. down that avenue. But yeah, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I imagine because I, well, I've had a couple people come in and say, I was just, they, I was discharged. They gave me a bunch of resources, but I'm, on the streets now and I and I can't get anywhere you know it's like they just gave me a bunch of things papers right. okay now what right I still don't I'm still not housed I still don't have a recovery well, and that's, that's they're yeah. not supposed to do that that's yeah. that's that's the crazy part like um there's actually they actually have access to resources mm -hmm. and especially chronically homeless people like these are some of the best candidates that are supposed to be going into these spaces that they have <laughs> And, um, you know, it's really a matter of these workers doing, connecting with clients and doing, getting their job, doing their job. It's so much easier just to give them papers and kick them out on the street. Yeah. Then say, hey, okay, um, uh, this is what I need from you. This is what, you know, this is what your options are. We, we can put you into this space. And because a lot of people need support services or they can't do their ADLs or, you know, so, um, you know, they need to go into a space that, you know, 
they couldn't go into a non-congregate shelter where, you know, you have to be able to perform your ADLs. So, you know, it's just, they have access to other resources and they get away with it all the time, putting people right back to the streets. It's just a, a problem. And I don't know any way other, I don't know any other way of solving this issue other than, you know, um, you know, people demanding th <laughs> that they see this worker and like, they do something like, no, you guys, I need, you know, and showing back up at their step, like I need a caseworker, I need somebody to follow up with, I need somebody to talk to. So like when they get with somebody like you, mm -hmm. hey, this is who I seen, this was her name. And then, you know, um, you know, maybe be there on a three way call, because then, like you said, it becomes the issue of giving patient confidentiality. You can't then represent anybody or speak on their behalf without them there. And it, it's it's messy. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. Everything you said, I agree. <laughs> oh. In, okay. I was trying to look for it. There is, so the, the one way that m the other route might be going to the county itself, like the Redmond um, County and, uh, and asking for a case manager because they know they have housing case managers you know, depending on where you're, where you're, am I thinking county office? What am I saying? Uh, yeah, so they're, 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 I was, I was trying to look for the person's name, but I will, I know someone in Redmond who does a lot of um, housing outreach for people. So um, I can always pass it on to, through the city. So, um, yeah, the system unfortunately is flawed and even with all the different resources out there, people, you know, especially if you imagine having a cognitive issue and getting a bunch of, well, here, here's a list of resources and you're like, uh, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how to go through this. I don't even know what the first step is. Like, okay, so when I pick up the phone to this first place, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> or you have someone in, tra in trauma you know, or has had a history of trauma and doesn't want to go to a shelter because they feel like it's going to re-traumatize them, then what, you know? There's so many issues like that that come up. I'm so appreciative of you guys having this conversation here because I, I feel like um, the just knowing the ins and outs of every system that we in human services have to navigate and have to help other people navigate um, it, it's so overly complicated. I'm so, you know, changing all the time. Um, and so I just, I just want to say, I really, I just really appreciate y'all having that, you know, having that conversation in this space. Um, I know we're, we are past eight o'clock now, but, um, Pam did have a couple, just a couple more questions in the chat. If you're open to answering them, Mandy, and then, um, we can wrap things up if you're, if you're ready to after that. Oh, um, so what, so Pam, one of the questions is you said, do we serve families? Um, so we usually, we usually do individual services. Um, a family member could, you know, say, I'm concerned about my son or daughter uh, with a, a disability. What services can I provide them? Um, ultimately, though, the person with a disability, whatever that might be, needs to be the one to reach out because we're very, we're very participant driven. So unless we know the participant is consenting and wants this information or wants a certain lifestyle or quality of life, we're not going to talk to their to their guardian or their parent. We're going to talk to them and say, well, what do you want? <laughs> um, so it kind of makes it, we don't really like have a, a fam like it's like um we wouldn't work with like family members all together. It gets that tar that specific person with what they how they would like to live in their community. And that can mean many different things to many different people. Um, what was the other thing? Oh, Zoom. Um, right now, all of our uh, groups are in person. Uh, we are trying to figure out how to maybe sometimes do hybrid. Um, and we are going to be opening up new new programs coming up soon in the fall. So stay tuned. Is it really? 
Very cool. Sounds like a good reason to get on that, the newsletter, the email list yeah. for those upcoming fall programs. Yes. Well, awesome. Um, Mandy, anything else? Cynthia, anything else you guys want to, you want people to know about Disability Empowerment Center before we, before we wrap things up? Cynthia, did I miss anything? I hope I did. Um, but you... No, I just encourage people to come and join us and work with us. It can definitely help you <laughs> and empower you to work together. And what I like about it is that we are not experts. We're kind of, we really are working, working alongside you. So if I don't know something or Cynthia doesn't know something, we are working together in the moment to figure out the answer or the next step. So um, I like that model a lot. I think it's, I think it is like uh, empowering to people, which is what we are hoping to project. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I love it that people say, well, we're not going to hold their low barrier shelters and caseworkers. We're not going to hold their hand. Well, some people need their hand held mm -hmm. and that's okay. Yeah, and that's, that's true. Oops, you, you got on mute there for a second, Beatrice. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I might do that. But yeah, that's, that's just, it blows me away all the time. I hear that out of service workers. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, well, they need to do some work too. And it's like, wait, you don't think they're trying? Like this is a complex, not even your, not even you. I mean, you're getting paid to do this stuff or, or, or navigating these waters and, and making sense of all of this. Like people also have, you know, like you said, they're dealing with X, Y, and Z, uh, uh, you know, different abilities, you know, like you said, uh, they may not know how it was when they're reaching out for help and asking for help. It's not because they're lazy. It's not because they're drug addicts or because they don't want to do the works. People need help. And, you know, some people need you to hold their hand and help them with it. And that's okay. You know, people need the help. And I think that places like this, like what you're doing, what you guys are doing here is great. It's, you may be small, but you are mighty in the need because people need it. Yeah, so well, thank you so much for having um, us here. Uh, yeah, it's a really nice forum to like be able to let people know who we are and where we are and all of that. Thank you so much for being here, Mandy and Cynthia. And Doris had to hop off a little bit earlier, but I, I so, so appreciate all of you um, being willing to to participate and share share about your organization and and have have an awesome conversation tonight. Um, I like I said, I'm gonna send out a follow up email in the next few days with the recording of this session and any of the relevant uh, important information um, that would be helpful to you all. Um, so you can expect to see that very soon. Um, and then I am just sending, if you have the capacity, I'm just sending our demographics uh, survey for NAMI Eastside programming in the chat. So um, I just sent that link um, and I'll send that in the follow-up email as well. It just gives us feedback on our programs, lets us know who's attending and just helps us um, fund more forums like this where we can partner and, and showcase everything going on around us. Um, we uh, we have the lovely privilege of sharing the Together Center with one of um, Disability Empowerment Center's offices. So I'm sure I will see y'all around. But but yeah, thank you so, so much for being here tonight. Um, I really, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, and thanks everybody for joining tonight. I really appreciate everyone, everyone in the audience joining us and chiming in. You guys had some great engaging questions. So thank you so, so much. Um, again, this uh, space is a monthly space, monthly educational forums around the fourth Tuesday of every month. So um, so yeah, feel free to, to check our website for when um, our August details get confirmed and um, circle back and come back and join us for another one next month. So um, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>